Hello everyone, this is Michael Pierce and uh, this video has been a long time coming because I am finally going to talk about the Enneagram. Um, uh, I hope you're not disappointed that this is only a podcast at this point, but um, I felt like that would be in the current state that I, I'm in. If I was going to talk about the Enneagram, this is really the best way for me to do it at this point um, because I've just been so busy right now and also because I am not, I just am not nearly, I haven't spent nearly as much time with the Enneagram as I have with MBTI. And so if I'm going to talk about it, I'd prefer to do it in a more informal style to sort of demonstrate that, um, you know, I, this is very open for sort of corrections and things, but um, at the very least what I, what I want to do here is I want to run through all nine types of the Enneagram, all nine personality types. And I want to sort of be, try to represent how they blur into each other and also represent very much just the kernel of what each one is about on kind of um, almost like a mantra level. But without further ado, um, you'll notice that this is very much just an overview of just the types of the Enneagram. I'm not getting into the history, although there is a long Sort of rich tradition as I understand it, but mainly I'm just concerned with what it actually says about personality types. And so hopefully I can give that a proper representation. So there are, uh, if you imagine um, a circle, you divide that circle into thirds and uh, each third sort of represents a different uh, aspect of the human being that the Enneagram personality types, each one of them sort of focuses on. So there's nine types total, uh, eight, nine, and one correspond to what's referred to as the body. And their sort of focus is anger, and that will probably sound odd, but I'll, I'll get to what that actually means in a minute here. So eight, nine, and one are focused on anger and the body. Um, two, three, and four uh, that third is focused on the heart and shame is sort of the focus, the negative focus there. And five, six, and seven, that completing the cycle, those are focused on the mind and on fear. So, um, and, and so let, uh, let me explain what that all means. So the idea, one, one of the ideas behind the Enneagram is uh, the notion that each of these types um, and each of these thirds that sort of overarch the types represent fixations that the human psyche kind of gets stuck on and which, um, and that's sort of where it's coming from. I'm not going to get as much into that. I'm just sort of going to describe without any value judgments as best as I can anyway, uh, what's, what I understand seems to be going on for these types. Um, neither good nor bad, just just sort of is, um, and so. Uh, but some of the some of the wording probably has certain uh, connotations, but um, I don't mean them that way. Anyway, so let's start with body. Um, so the idea here with eight, nine, and one has to do with anger, and there's kind of this notion that. Uh, this sort of visceral physical notion. I, I remember hearing, I can't remember where, but uh, sort of this metaphysical notion of now you're in a body and now that you're in a body that makes you angry. <laughs> because, assumedly because you can now feel things and things sort of can jab at you and pins and needles and things irritate you and you respond to it in sort of this visceral way with your body by getting angry. And um, now, I'm sure there are people who relate to these three types who are kind of like they probably don't like the connotations of that because they're like, well, it's, it's not like I have temper issues. Some people might, but other people are like, I don't, I don't think I have temper issues. I don't think of myself like that. In which case, it's always kind of like, well, yeah, it's a, it's a general kind of notion that once you understand what's meant by anger, and I'll get into it in a moment, but... Um, in fact, I'll just go ahead and get into it now. I'm going to start with type 1 and move my way around, and then we'll come back to types 8 and 9 at the end. But, uh, or maybe I'll go through. No, I, I prefer to do it this way. So with type 1, 
the way, as it were, that sort of the bodily anger is expressed is type one is often called the reformer. Sometimes people just simply call them the perfectionist. Uh, I, I believe there's a couple more names for it, but the idea here is that the anger is expressed, um, or rather the, angles, the anger sort of fuels this sense of reform and perfectionism, like I just said. Uh, so you kind of, you have this notion of, um, the way I've heard, of it, heard it explained is you have like an ideal in your head and it's like you're trying to arrange things in the outside world to match up with that ideal. Um, and this is very much like an important thing and so that's why they're sort of a perfectionist, right? It's, it's very kind of a platonic thing. And some people say that Plato was a type one. Um, I, don't, I don't know about that, but uh, uh, it certainly matches up with this idea of you have these ideal forms and you are trying to match up uh, things in this world with that. So one of the problems you can have with a type one is that's where the anger comes out, where they kind of, uh, they can be uh, almost like a bit of a crusader. Um, that has connotations of sort of a recklessness that isn't there, I don't think. But, um, but you certainly have this notion of uh, a kind of righteous mission that they're sort of setting out, and they probably won't, u they won't use that language, but it's, it's sort of a, um, they're seeking to, they tend to nitpick because they're perfectionistic. And they're trying to make things so that they're correct and right and pure, and they start. They go back to this ideal that they're always trying to get back to. So I, I probably butchered that for some of you guys, but that's the basic idea. So you, that you at least have like a jumping-off point to understanding kind of what's going on with one. It's it's anger, this kind of internal anger that is expressed through them trying to make things better, and so. Uh, you know, this is where you get kind of like your stereotypical um, over-the-top uh, or overzealous uh, uh, religious reformer or something like this, you know, um, who is like, things are not right and I'm going to go forth and express my anger in such a way that will change things so that they'll be better and that they'll fit the ideal and, uh, you know, that can be extraordinarily great. Like with Gandhi, some people say that Gandhi is a type one, um, and obviously he was able to, uh, assuming that he was a type one, um, it would fit the model in the sense that he expressed his, he was able to express his anger in a nonviolent way, and in a way that actually was very inspiring. And, you know, he was able to um, uh, create the change that he wanted in, in that way. And, but of course, there are aspects of Gandhi that people are severely criticized. Uh, so let's move on now to the shame part of the Enneagram. That would be, or the heart part of the Enneagram. And that is two, three, and four. So what this is referring to is it's referring to the heart. This is sort of the more... Um, I, I need a better word than emotional, but you kind of get the same sort of feeling you get in Myers-Briggs, where it's like, no, feeling doesn't only mean emotion. That comes into play more often, but that's not what it means. It's not just irrational emotion. It's actually highly rational sort of dealing with feelings and the meaning of existence and the, the sort of feeling tones or the sentiment. Um, that we asso that emotion gets associated with, but you know, it's it's kind of like you know, poetry isn't just pure emotion. Poetry is actually highly rational and organized when it's good poetry, but it's highly feeling, and we I wish we had a better word for it. But um, anyway, that's just a side note. But the main thing that you have here is that uh, sort of the idea is because you're focused on the heart, the potential problem, just like the focus more on the body or the kinesthetic kind of tends towards this sort of physical aggression or anger that kind of uh, wells up. Um, when there's a focus on the heart, there's much more of a sense of uh, shame is the word that I've often heard. 
Um, and so the idea is uh, they, they lose that sense of self, uh, as it were. And suddenly it's sort of a matter of I need to kind of redeem myself or I'm not, I'm not good enough and I need to try to fix this situation. And so with the type two, the way that they try to fix the situation is by helping other people. That's why they're called the helper, a rather unoriginal title, um, but uh, that's why they're called that because they are trying to sort of redeem themselves or redeem their own shame by helping other people and doing things for other people. And sort of by doing so, they sort of show, hey, I'm actually worth it. I'm actually worth things because look at what I've done for these other people. And um, so you, you know, you get these very, uh, assumedly you might typically get very uh, affectionate people, people who bake you cookies <laughs> or whatever. Uh, I'm sure that there's actually only a minority who actually bake cookies, but, um, but uh, you know, just like with the, the type one, you, you can go overboard with that where the anger, it starts becoming far too much of the anger coming out and they're not expressing it well. With the type two, you assumedly can get um, where the shame becomes uh, sort of much more of the motivation than just the actual service and it becomes basically a kind of selfish thing or it can be um, where they struggle with they do things for other people really just because they want to feel better themselves and not for the other people involved and so what can happen is you like you know for instance someone might bake cookies without being asked to bake cookies and then they sort of expect you to treat them a certain way because of that or for them to sort of get favors or reciprocation out of that that will help them to feel because they're depending on you to kind of help them feel like they're worth it. But if they're doing things with kind of that underhandedness to it, um, then obviously that really turns people off and also they're not going to get the reciprocation they want. And so that can be very frustrating um, and it can lead to a lot of conflicts and people get very uh, you know, um, it, it, it can be frustrating. On the other hand, however, um, when you're able to kind of integrate the, uh, uh, this sort of fixation better into you in a healthier way so that it's not controlling you but you're more in control of it, then you get incredibly selfless people. And so you get people who, you know, just take the shirt off their backs to, uh, to help you and they don't have any problem with them. They're just the nicest people ever. And we all love cookies, you know. So uh, that's, that's great. Uh, moving right along. And uh, once again, as I'm doing this, I'm glad I'm doing it as a podcast. I mean, because I wouldn't, well, frankly, I wouldn't be able to write a script for this because I just feel sort of inadequate in my knowledge. But I, I, I find that it's a very helpful way for me to if I can explain it, and not just to myself, but to an audience. And so you're being my guinea pigs. Thank you for that. Those of you who are listening, uh, we'll see. I'm always sort of worried that I'm going to misrepresent a type and uh, spread more infor- misinformation. Oh dear heavens, I hope not. But can't be avoided. We'll just see how it goes. Anyway, so you move from type 2 to type 3. So the transition here is very interesting because where's the type two was trying to redeem their internal shame uh, of, of, of self by serving other people and it's all about sort of losing yourself to other people. And Because with type three you have this transition where it's like this compromise between yourself and the other people. And there's still this sense that you are redeeming yourself um, through other people's help that you're sort of redeeming yourself in the eyes of others but now it's not about you doing things for those other people it's about you showing it's much more about you sort of showing how great you are to those other people I know that sounds awful (laughs) I I am not a type 3 and so I apologize if I'm presenting this in an unflattering light I don't mean it that way Uh, because, but that's essentially what you have here is they're sort of trying to 
overcome their internal feeling shame uh, by means of demonstrating their own sort of awesomeness to other people. And so you, the, they are called the achievers by most sources for this reason, because this gives them an incredible drive to achieve, not just to sort of do things for other people, but to achieve their own greatness and to sort of show how, um, how awesome they are and look at what I can do. And so uh, according to some sources, you get Augustus Caesar, which is very interesting um, because Augustus Caesar, if you know anything about him, he literally had like this big long analog or, or, or some, some such written where it basically just enumerated all of his accomplishments as emperor of Rome. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's kind of like, wow, that's like incredibly vain. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like the guy did do a lot of really helpful things for Rome. I mean, I don't want to get into an argument about whether or not they were good or not, but he, he accomplished, he was driven by that to accomplish so much, like just really incredible stuff. Um, and so you get very, you can get very active people uh, with it who kind of have this idea that they're trying to, um, you know, kind of the image that I get in my mind is you get the guy who has the really sweet uh, jacket and he buys a super sweet car and he makes sure to drive it up to school every day because he's sort of just showing off. And, ah, oh gosh, that, that makes them sound so vain. And I know that they're... I know that they are not necessarily like that. I'm trying to exaggerate to show it because, you know, there's people who do that, but they're but you actually like them, and it's not like they're narcissistic at all. It's just, it's actually kind of fun because everyone likes well, not everyone, but most people are like that's a sweet car, and as long as they're not like uh, overly self-absorbed about it, you know, because once again, it's not they don't have that inner kind of, they, they don't really have that inner resolve. The whole point is they're trying to kind of show or justify the fact that they're here, as it were. Um, I hope that I'm describing that right. So once again, kind of on the bright side of this, it can motivate uh, an incredible amount of achievement, um, of sort of personal achievement and personal stature. On the other end of the spectrum, though, uh, as I've sort of already suggested, um, sort of the vice that they can run into is vanity. They can become too focused on showing off that um, it really, once it ironically turns people off and actually becomes counterproductive to what they're trying to do. And they can, at that point, I'm sure, they can become insufferable. <laughs> but, but um, but, uh, you know, if you have personal experiences, please, you know, point out whether or not I'm getting that right uh, about kind of how the type 3 works. So you transition from the type 3 over to the type 4. And this is where it's kind of this transfer from focusing on redeeming your shame through others it passes through the type three where it's sort of this compromise between I'm showing how awesome I myself am, but I require others to kind of uh, justify that. With the type four, it's transferred all the way over to there isn't this focus on others. It's much more on the self, but it's about I'm going to redeem my shame by being sort by me myself being great. Um, but let me define great here, because what you, what you kind of have is uh, this notion of I'm going to make myself into a work of art in its own right. I'm going to make something of myself. And there isn't this focus on, it doesn't really matter if other people recognize it or not. What matters is that you feel satisfied with it. Of course, the horrible truth is that you probably won't ever feel satisfied with it. I don't know, though, but, um, you know, you get kind of this notion of, I'm trying to make myself worth it to myself. Um, I'm trying to show uh, my, my shame that I am, in fact, worth it because I am this great 
uh, uh, this great um, sort of work of art. So you don't get this achievement thing. Uh, often these types are called the individualist for this reason, because it's not about achievement. Uh, you don't get that sort of um, sense with like Augustus Caesar where he's like, I'm trying to show that I'm worth it. It's very much more of I'm trying to define myself and through that, uh, whether or not other people recognize it and, and it is kind of entirely beside the point. And so on the good side of this, you get like fantastic artists <laughs> or fantastic writers or um, just fantastic, fascinating people who, you know, they, they're like these stars that generate their own elements entirely of themselves and then they spew, the, spew it out kind of as an accidental afterthought onto the universe and it's like, holy crap, now we have like all these great metals. That was a really odd way to put it. But you know, it's, it's this sort of separate um, incubator kind of thing going on. Um, and because it's not concerned with, it, it's not really about what other people have to say about it that much, um, it, it allows it to become incredibly original. And originality, um, not all the time, but uh, you know, we need that aspect of things to kind of help check and balance uh, things. And so, but uh, so on the, on the good side, you get um, some sources say, if you've heard of the uh, uh, Rumi, um, the Islamic poet, I believe. Uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, but he has very interesting turns of phrase and he has very interesting ways of saying things that um, are very kind of individual and he strikes me as a very well, uh, as it were, developed or, or adjusted type four. Um, and, and it allows him to create this beautiful poetry and, and just uh, gorgeous kind of stuff about God and, and whatnot. Uh, but on the, on the bad side, um, you can get an individual who's sort of so focused on, I need to make myself beautiful, that they kind of become self-centered in sort of a very dangerous way. Uh, because they're trying to, they, they kind of become very melancholy, or they could become very melancholy, and um, kind of because that's a part of, that's almost like expressing that melancholy as much as possible is a part of the, the act of beauty. And um, that can be difficult to be around, uh, you know, if it's really bad because they're just so, so kind of focused and they're not thinking about you at all. <laughs> they're thinking about uh, uh, how they themselves can be great and how they themselves can um, display themselves. And oh, good heavens, odds are those who are type fours, this is, uh, I guarantee that almost all of you are not like this, of course, when I qualify it with the almost all, that uh, means that like every one of you will, <laughs> will think or assume <laughs> that, well, I'm the one couple. Uh, I, I apologize. I don't mean to stereotype. I, I, uh, I hope my talking about Rumi has shown how much I love this uh, and, and really appreciate it. Some of the great artists and, and thinkers and things have been type fours. And uh, it's great, but I'm just trying to show the good and the bad side potentially of each one. So uh, on the bad side, what you're essentially getting is uh, kind of a self, almost like a self-sacrificing, but not for others, for yourself. Um, and that, uh, you know, you can sort of imagine the implications of such a, of such a state. Um, I believe... I think it was the same fellow who gave the example that I mentioned earlier, but I can't remember his name. I'll see if I can find it. But um, he gave the example of, of uh, uh, there's a character in some play who's like, you know, at the very end of the play, she's like drunk out of her mind and she's just wandering down the street in like half-ripped clothes saying, someday my prince will come. 
it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's like horrifying. But it's like the worst kind of possible place that it could eventually go. So it's like this hyper exaggeration um, that pretty much no one really fits, but it's kind of where it could tend to go if it gets out of hand is this sort of, I'm going to, is this tragedy that they kind of have going on. So I hope that makes sense. Then you have a big swing. Um, you swing from the heart to the head, so the type 4 to the type 5. So what you had with 2, 3, and 4 is you had this notion, you probably noticed very much this notion of um, trying to make myself something, trying to justify the fact that I'm here now, that I'm around. and. Uh, it's, this, it, it's sort of more emotionally tied. But then what you have is this switch from the heart to the mind. And essentially what happens between four and five, if I understand it right, is um, basically the type four, uh, so if you wanna look at this progression, you start with a type one who has a body, expresses anger, but then when they switch to type two, they sort of lose that body and they become entirely focused not on trying to reform things to an ideal, but just simply trying to redeem their own shame through helping other people. So there's still that outward motion. Then in type three, the outward motion starts to turn inwards because they're, they're not just trying to lose themselves to others, they're trying to show how great they themselves are. Then in type four, it's sort of totally turned inward where it's I'm going to become a great individual artist and thus redeem myself for myself. Um, once you've passed through type four, the self has fully coagulated, as it were, because of this intensity of, of inwardness, and you get the type five. The type five is the newly born self, as it were, and this is the type I relate to, but I'm not going to let that uh, cloud what I'm talking about here as best I can. What you get with the type five is now that you kind of have this newborn self, uh, you want to protect it. And there's very much a sense with the type five um, and uh, uh, that you are trying to protect this newly born self from the outside world. Um, so that, uh, not really for clear reasons, to be honest. <laughs> there's just this sense of, protection. So what's going on here is this, you've now entered from the heart to the mind. So now you've moved from this more primitive, well, I shouldn't say primitive, but um, obviously I'm biased. Uh, you move from that realm to the, uh, the heady realm where the problem isn't shame. I don't really relate to the notion of shame. The notion is fear, which I do relate to uh, as much as I don't always really want to admit it. Um, because in, with feeling, the problem is, shame is very much a feeling, but fear is very much a psychological thing. It has a lot to do with you thinking about things and creating constructs that frighten you. And, um, and so that it's five, six, and seven have to do with fear. And each one of them is sort of trying, now that they sort of have this newborn self, the self is now sort of able to be afraid of things, whereas that wasn't really a thing before. Um, it's, uh, one, could, uh, one could even venture to say, and this is 100% me and probably isn't right, that you know, the, the self that was there in two, three, and four was kind of in the stages of, of dying, and that's why there was sort of this focus on elsewhere. It might even be that from one to two, the self has kind of died and now the self is trying to redeem itself through others and then it starts to kind of reform like a phoenix and you get to type four and all of the energies moving inwards in an attempt to kind of start the flame and then you move to type five where it's officially reborn and now it's kind of new and that, hence it's terrified of everything. <laughs> because, you know, it, it feels weak internally, it feels sensitive internally. And that's very much what you get with a type five, is they deal with their fear. They deal with their fear of the world um, by creating a fortress around themselves. It's very much like a castle or a fortress. Um, you maintain the boundaries. 
you're setting up boundaries by which to protect yourself. And you can, there's many different ways of doing this. Um, the most common way and the most well-known way is by gathering knowledge. There's kind of this notion of if I can just, um, that I, you know, I really relate to, there's very much this sort of hunger for I need to know more. Um, there's the sense of I'm not competent enough. I don't know enough. I'll never know enough. Um, but I can do everything I can to learn more and more so that when the time comes, I can then put my knowledge to good use and sort of keep maintaining those boundaries. So hence why you have this fellow with glasses who's on the internet talking all the time about Jungian typology. <laughs> Because it's like, I want to know, if I'm going to know about this, I feel like I want to know everything I can. I want to feel as competent as possible. And that sometimes causes problems because it's, I'm an INFJ and, and it can be difficult for me to absorb new information. It takes me a while, so it can be very frustrating. And the same way with philosophy. And so you get that notion with fives that, uh, you know, this kind of notion of they get fixated on a pretty singular topic that they then learn literally everything about. And they, they sort of relish, and, and that knowledge is almost like the walls of their castle that they literally built with their own two hands. And they just, they want to show off this castle. But for some reason, no one else seems to be interested, probably because they didn't build the freaking castle. So it's like they don't have an investment in what you've built here, but it's like, oh, you know, it's just sitting here and it's protecting me, but I want to show it off to people. And so that's where you get the type five who just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and talks for hours on end, like I'm doing right now, because it's like they just need to get this info out. And, you know, it's like you just, you really want to. And so you can and you, uh, that's why they're called sometimes the scholar. They're also called the investigator because what you have is they're trying to protect themselves from dangers in the outside world um, by building up this wall of knowledge. But there's other ways of doing it, not just knowledge, although that's sort of a big part of it. But I do really think that, um, and I don't want to go too far with this, but I do know that for me, myself, um, I tend with my body language very much to sort of be very protective or, you know, um, I, you, some of you have probably noticed, as I've said before, I'm a very private person. Um, I get very, very uh, sensitive around, you know, attempts to get at me, get at my information or where I am or what what I am, you know, I don't feel safe. It feels like I'm exposing that little newborn self to other people. And I'm like, no, I, I want that to develop more. And it's like, no, I, I don't trust you with my baby. I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't feel like I can trust you yet. I'm not going to hand my baby to someone who I consider a stranger, you know. Um, it's not how I roll. And so you kind of have this... Uh, very private, and that's why the, the word that is used to describe the type 5 is stingy um, or even avaricious. Uh, and, you know, I can relate to that because it's like you're just sort of sucking in as much knowledge as possible and building up your walls and filling your walls with food storage and books and more knowledge and stuff. Because there's sort of this notion that the knowledge and, and by doing this preparation, it's going to save you. So you can get this sense with the type 5 that there's sort of this very um, highly introverted person who kind of stays inside all the time. And, uh, and, and they're just sort of uh, like for, well, but you know, you get, you get the idea. They're trying to protect themselves through knowledge and very guarded very, um, so you get that notion of they're sort of detached, not because they really are detached, but because they're so sensitive to everything. You know, their skin is so sensitive that they feel this need to protect themselves. And so you've probably noticed, especially in uh, Sukat David, actually, <laughs> she correctly pointed out that I'm a type five because the way that I described my aversion to introverted feeling was incredibly type five-ish. 
It was basically me saying, get out of my space. Stop trying to make me feel things. You can't control me. Um, and uh, that's just one more thing I want to mention about type 5 is there is that notion of, um, you, know, ju you know, just anything that wants to, and it's not just for type 5, but I especially relate to that notion of I do not want to be controlled. I do not want anyone else invading my space. I don't like being overloaded. That's why I'm often in empty classrooms, just walking back and forth talking to myself. And You know, the problem here is on the good side, you get somebody who can become very, very, very knowledgeable about something. Um, and you get people, you know, there's a lot of philosophers. Nietzsche, I believe, was a type five. Um, and that's part of why I relate to him so much. And you can see it, it once you understand that uh, assuming I'm correct in, and that Walter Kaufman is correct in saying that the will to power is really essentially a will to freedom. And the way that he describes power is actually like very type five-ish in that at least in, in sort of his notes and things. So, you know, you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. But um, he describes his notion of power as you accumulate energy into yourself that you use to sort of push other elements off that will attempt to control you. And it's basically this will to freedom is what it really is. And it's like, oh, so you're type five. Uh, on the other side, however, you can get somebody who becomes so cut off from society that they don't really have any social skills. Um, and this can really become a problem if they're, you know, you can get a type five who doesn't interact with people at all and their fear starts to take over because they wall themselves in so much and they become incredibly lonely and even worse than that their ideas can start to become weirder and weirder and weirder and less and less attached to actual reality and more and more just sort of self-referential which some people accuse Nietzsche of um, or some of these other philosophers as sort of building ivy towers we move from type 5 to type 6. So the motion here is whereas type 5 uh, basically tries to protect itself or deal with its fear by uh, basically no longer interacting with things or limiting its interaction, sort of detaching itself, type 6, if I understand correctly, deals with the fear in the totally opposite sense that they actually attach themselves to things. And so what that means is that the type six is sometimes called the loyalist. Um, it, I guess it'd probably be nice to give them another title, but it's basically they're dealing with their um, they're dealing with their fear by finding safe ground to stand on. So type five, in some sense, is kind of like I'll create my own ground to stand on. The type six is not so sort of self-optimistic in this way. Uh, as it were. And it's very much more of, I need to find safe ground that is not myself to stand on. Um, and I need to, you know, I, and in fact, in some sense, you, if you wanted to continue the progression, you see that you have this new soul, you have the type five who walls themselves into the castle, and then finally realizes that, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it on my own. <laughs> you know, what do you know? Uh, who would have thought? But um, kind of like I'm not going to make it on my own. I need to make attachments to other people because my walls aren't sufficient. I, I don't have the strength. And so then you get sort of the type six where the type six sort of seeks either for other people or else for an organization or like a dogma or, or something like this that sort of is able to provide the, the comfort and the security that they sort of crave against fears in the world. They sort of, they want that security of being able to have things more settled. And whereas the type five kind of creates it for themselves or sort of uh, almost kind of <laughs> sort of salvages or even sort of steals in a certain sense for itself, these things, you know, it's because it's very introverted. The type six is like, no, no, no. I need, to, I need to sort of align myself with something else, something that's greater than me that will, um, that, that, because I've learned that I can't do it myself and I need something else. I need an idea or I need um, an organization or something along these lines. 
Um, I know that makes them seem like, the way that I've put it there makes it seem like they're just sort of these conformists. And that, that's a completely wrong notion. Um, because, you know, you could get somebody, and I'm not saying they're a type six, but you, there's a lot of brilliant, like uh, Blaise Pascal. Uh, I don't believe he's a type six, but you can get someone like that who they're like 100% you know, aligned with the Catholic faith, more or less. They're kind of like, this is right. I'm good with this. But that doesn't make him any less brilliant because he like produces, you know, brilliant work and beautiful work that's very individual and with him himself, but he produces it after he sort of aligned himself with his organization and it sort of provides the inspiration. You might also get, um, uh, and even just setting that aside, I'm almost, you know, in saying that, it's almost like I'm basically saying, you know, they can be kind of like type fives too, therefore they're okay, which is no good. Um, but uh, what you can, with a type six, you know, because they're, the good side that you can get is like the most loyal friends ever. Because it's sort of like, there is that sense of I can't do it myself, so I need to be loyal to other people. And I need to, and they need me. You know, that's like a great feeling, I assume, for them, for anybody. Um, and they don't have kind of that, with a type 5, that can make them incredibly nervous because they're like, oh crap, somebody actually needs me. Now I've got to like let them be able to touch my newly born soul and they might drop me wrong or something. <laughs> um, but the type 6 doesn't have that kind of fear. Um, you know, they, they want to attach to other people. And so, these are like very loyal friends. In a sense, kind of, you know, you get a thing with the, like with the type two, take the shirt off your back. Same thing with type six, um, I believe. Uh, you know, because you get the most loyal people um, who they're not giving up any of their own personal genius. It's just that they're aligning it in the service of something that they believe is greater than them, like the duty to a friend or something. Uh, conversely, however, if you get a type six who becomes so focused on doing this only because they are afraid of the outside world and they just sort of want to save their own skin, well, you know, you can think of all kinds of organizations that have sort of members that just follow it because they're terrified and, you know, they basically say, here's our ideology. Our ideology demonizes such and such a group. Great, that sets everything nicely in stone, um, where, you know, they're the bad guys, we're the good guys. It's, now it's not so complicated and, and frightening and, and weird and I don't know where to turn. Now I know where to turn and so now we'll go and burn the witch. Um, I, I'm being a little facetious there. I don't mean to be insulting. I'm just trying to show kind of where it can go right and where it can go wrong. Um, you know, obviously where it can go right is you get somebody who is aligned with a good cause and keeps their conscience and they're not giving that up but they're loyal to something that they know is bigger than them and they'll give up of themselves for that. But uh, if the cause is wrong and is motivated not by genuine loyalty but really just by fear and terror, um, then you get mob mentality, uh, you know, and uh, that sort of thing. Moving on from six, you get to seven, the last of the mind types and the last one dealing with fear. And the type seven is interesting because in my mind anyway, the type seven's almost like a compromise between the attachment versus detachment because the type seven is basically, if I understand it right, running away from their fear. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's like somebody running from their creditors and they don't stay in the same city for more than like two weeks before they feel like, oh crap, the creditors are going to catch up to me. I need to move on to the next thing. <laughs> um, so while they're in that city, they're like having a great time. But then when it's time to move, they've got to move. And so it's like this compromise between, it's like, you know, you detach yourself by attaching only for certain amounts of time. And Although, actually, that's not really the best way to put it. Really what it is, is it's, it's still totally attachment, but it's an attachment to things that aren't really there. There's sort of this sense of anticipation with the type 7. There's a sense that 
thing, you know, somewhere over the rainbow or the grass is greener on the other side. I've attached myself not to an organization or an idea out there, but to an idea that isn't even really there yet. And it's kind of what's, and if I stay in one place for too long, then I'm going to get stuck. I'm going to get trapped. And it's like, no, I need to go out and find God, as it were. <laughs> as it were. I'm not suggesting that they are all religious. It's just sort of what popped into my head, you know. So for the type 7, it's like you're trying to go out and find the thing. You're sort of always seeking, always planning, always trying to, always anticipating the next great thing, and but never really being satisfied. And so there's kind of, there can be, whether it's physical or not, or just mental, like in the realm of ideas, uh, sort of this wanderlust. You're kind of, um, you know, so on the good side, you get some of the most fun people you ever meet. Um, and that probably sounds sort of shallow, but when I say fun, I'm talking about like the, the person who, like if you're going, like you're going through a depression, um, or like you're really sad and then you meet a type 7 they're like, hey, let's go, <laughs> let's go out into the, you know, whoop, we're going to go on an adventure and they like drag you along for this adventure. <laughs> and next thing you know, you, you know, you've, you've made like a whole movie uh, of just misadventures with this type 7, you know, you run off, you find enlightenment and the next thing you know they're riding off into the sunset and you're stuck here and uh, back where you started, but you've got all this new experience. So that's sort of a romanticized version of a type 7 kind of encounter, as it were. Um, the bad side, obviously, is that uh, it if it was not a good experience or if you wanted them to stay and they didn't, um, you can get people who are incredibly flighty or never stay for anything. Uh, obviously, I think in our society especially, we look very much down on that more than other things. We don't like it when people uh, don't seem, they don't seem to take things seriously in the way that we want them to take things seriously. They most certainly do take things seriously, but they're taking it, they're doing it in this sort of, um, in this way that they, they're always running from one thing to the next and they can never quite get to the thing that they're looking for. But they're very energetic and they're very, they come off, I think, often as very optimistic. Um, maybe, probably not always, but, um, you know, so they're always, um, there's always kind of another day. There's always sort of something that's coming that they're waiting for, but they're waiting by always moving towards it. It's kind of interesting. Um, and, but it, it's essentially motivated by a fear. They don't want to get stuck. They don't want to get trapped. And they deal with that fear. Five deals with the fear by building a castle. Six deals with it by aligning themselves with, a, with um, stable ground. But seven deals with it by basically running away. Um, but they're not running away to nowhere. They are running generally away to something that will save them from this thing that they're afraid of, but they're afraid that if they stay in one place too long, then the creditors will catch up with them. Um, and so that's essentially type 7. Uh, so what happens is you move from type 7 to type 8, and so you're moving from the head back into the body again. So if you've kind of followed this, you had 5, which is in sort of my own narrative, the, new, the newborn soul who builds up a fortress, then they realize that they can't do it themselves, they go and try to get help from other people, but then they realize that other people aren't really going to help them necessarily, not 100%, so then they kind of go searching for something even greater, and that's sort of the type 7 in a sense, they kind of are looking for something that isn't there yet. And they're running, they're running from the fear now, and in my little narrative here, which probably needs some editing, you move into the type 8. And what happens with the type 8 is 7 is sort of you deal with it, you deal with the fear by flying away. By the time that you're 7, you know, you don't have a castle anymore. You don't, you're not really aligned with anything. And so you've necessarily kind of bulked yourself up. And uh, I don't know, you know, you could imagine it something like once you get to type 8, you, you're tired of running. And so you get yourself a fresh new body that can fight. 
you get yourself something that can now sort of express uh, spirit or, or sort of physicality. And this is where you start to get the type eight, where I'm not running anymore. I'm, I'm gonna stand and fight my fears. And you have this transfer then from you being afraid of things to you being sick and tired of that and now you're just angry at those things for making you afraid and you're kind of like, I'm never going to be afraid again. I'm just, I'm just sick and tired and irritated and I'm going to, I have this new body and I'm now going to express that against these things. So the eight is, um, uh, I think the seven is called the enthusiast. The eight is called the challenger because that's really essentially what they're doing. They're challenging their fears. And so the type eight really isn't uh, uh, motivated by fear. They're motivated by kind of this anger against things. How dare they try to make me afraid of them? <laughs> you know? So you get people who are like just dauntless. Um, you know, they, they, they never want to be afraid again. They've moved out of that. And so you present something to them that it's like, you know, and if you present it to them as sort of a challenge, as, you know, there's no way you'll be able to do this. And it's kind of like, I'm not afraid. I'm going to go ahead, you know, bam, I'm going to go ahead with this. Um, and then uh, I'm not weak. My, I'm not that newborn type five anymore. I'm, I've got a body. I've got strength. I'm going to take this thing on. So it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, you get people who are um, really motivated by this. Um, you can get people who are just, you know, if you want someone on your side in sort of a conflict, you'd want to type eight. Now I'm painting them obviously as like they're like fighters or like street fighters or something. And that's highly simplistic and sort of immature of me. <laughs> But, because it doesn't have to be like that, but in whatever pursuit they kind of go into, they kind of seem to bring some degree of a challenger mentality to them, where it's like, I'm going to uh, get this thing done, to sort of, and it's fueled by this anger, whereas with the type three, it's very much about sort of redeeming yourself by showing how great you are. With type eight, it has nothing to do with that. They don't really, once again, they don't care about what the other people think. It's very much about them, and it's about them demonstrating to themselves they don't need to be afraid anymore of things. And so uh, you, you get people who are just, once again, dauntless. That's sort of the good side of it. And you'll get people who aren't afraid to stand up for what they believe in, aren't afraid to stand up for you, um, will do things for you or just in general that no one else really has the courage for, um, they'll be the one to do it. You can get people who are really fun uh, because they're not afraid and they, they kind of will go out and, and do things. You know, you get an entrepreneur or you get someone who, uh, you know, because they have that energy in them. Um, but I'm sure it's easy enough to see where this could go horribly, horribly wrong, as with all of the Enneagrams. <laughs> yeah, obviously you can get somebody who has some serious anger issues um, in the sense that, you know, they're just sort of, they get brutal or they're just like senselessly uh, expressing their anger and just, you know, screaming or whatever. Um, I, well, and, and it's not that. That's once again a very simplistic view. It's just, you know, if you get one of them who's just uh, uh, got way too much anger and they're just far too focused on kind of how offended they are by these attempts to frighten them and how sick and tired they are of that, then you get someone who kind of goes off the rails and becomes uh, too violent, whether actually physically, which is probably not as common, um, or just sort of mentally or emotionally or, or so forth, you know. So it's kind of learning how to harness that fire for, uh, to, 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 for good ends. Now, interestingly, you move from the type eight to someone who looks really nothing like the type eight, and that's the type nine. And so what happens essentially is the type eight is kind of fighting this fight. They've turned around and now they're challenging things. And then they sort of tucker themselves out or they become disillusioned 
with themselves and what's been going on. And so they, um, uh, now that they're tuckered out, they kind of now try to deal with their anger because now the real problem is just the anger. It's just kind of there. The type nine tries to deal with the anger by, as it were, putting it to sleep or um, putting it at peace or trying to sort of bury it. And this is where you get to the peacemaker. This is sort of what they're called. Uh, the type nine is the one who they are, it probably sounds very odd when you know a type nine and then you learn that they're actually one of the anger types because you're like, they're not angry, but they are. But generally speaking, at least from the resources I've looked at, they, they never want to admit it because it's like they don't want to be angry anymore. They feel sort of embarrassed you know, that's just how I'm forming this narrative that they were the type eight and they were fighting everything. And now they're like, I don't want to fight anymore. I thought, you know, that's not who I am. It's not how I roll anymore, coach. You know, they've thrown, they, they've said, I'm going to, well, I'm going to get religion or something. I'm going to become enlightened and no longer need uh, this kind of um, uh, that anger anymore and so they're trying to kind of overcome it by sort of uh, putting it to sleep once again in themselves and so they are very peaceful and they don't come off as angry uh, however the potential there that you could get uh, is for it to express itself in sort of a passive aggressive way and you can get that with uh, you know, all the types in some sense. But here, you know, you get a particular brand or flavor of it um, because they don't want to admit that they're angry because being angry is bad. They don't want to be angry. They would feel bad if they realized they were angry or they'd be angry at themselves for being angry. So they have to find more appropriate ways to express it, which ultimately become much more sort of underhanded ways. I'm not saying this happens with, with all of them. I'm just saying it's a very, it, you know, sort of a natural outgrowth that can come, uh, that can come from them. Um, but essentially what you have is very peaceful people. You have people who can be very patient, um, ideally, uh, or who seem to be able to take a lot. They don't, they don't you know, do confrontation. Um, and so they can become good negotiators or they can be very, uh, uh, like it says, peacemakers. Um, and so I'm trying to think of an example. I'm afraid I, I can't at the moment, but uh, I wish I could, but I'm sure you can find some examples and check up if I'm doing this right. But obviously the, the unpleasant situation we can get into, which I already suggested, was if if the angers, if you know, they are so, if they're so focused on trying to kind of put the anger to sleep because they don't want to feel angry anymore, and if they're so focused on that, then it's just going to sort of bubble up, and you know, it's it kind of becomes that you can't really control it. It's just like magma uh, in there, and it starts to sort of burst through in sort of this passive-aggressive way, and they can become very difficult and confusing because on the one hand, they're they seem very calm, but on the other, it feels like kind of an uncomfortable facade for anger underneath there. And so that's in sort of the worst case scenario that you can get. And so that sort of finishes it up. What you have is you move from the type nine to the type one. And if I'm to continue my little narrative, that's where the type one is sort of the waking up from the attempt to put the anger to sleep. But now that the anger has gotten a good night's rest, the anger can now kind of go about things in a more um, organized way and it has sort of had dreams and it now has this ideal that it now kind of wants to implement in the world and so it starts enacting out of anger and then it dies in the process. No one ever says this, by the way. This is just sort of me creating a narrative on the fly to explain this. The one dies and it doesn't have the body anymore. It's now just sort of a pre-mortal spirit. And that's type two, kind of trying to justify and retain themselves in the world. Um, and then they go through the cycle again. Um, so yeah, that's the Enneagram. I hope you found it useful and enjoyable to kind of give you a basic idea of all of the types. 
and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.